For those of you here who know me, you might know a little bit about my fascination with the rock group KISS. You might also know that I uh, helped Tom Wyman here a little bit early on with Project Spectrum and doing some of the SketchUp stuff with autistic kids. So when I knew that John Elder Robinson was going to be in town in Boulder this next week, I kind of ran as fast as I could to try to see if he could stop by Boulder and talk briefly about his book, um, Look Me in the Eye, My uh, Life with Asperger's. Um, the reason he's important to me, not only because uh, of his valuable information with Asperger's and so forth, but also he created the guitarist for Ace Freely and Kiss, so he's kind of a little bit of an idol to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he worked in Pink Floyd's sound system and various other engineering type capacities. And now he's touring around with his book, and speaking to people, and helping with the cause of Asperger's. So please help me in welcoming um, John Elder Robson to Google. Well, thank you all for inviting me out and coming to see me. This is it's like a remarkable thing. It's like a world of geeks here. <laughs> Everyone's like, you know, shabbily dressed and scruffy looking and stuff. And, you know, this is really great. <laughs> if, if there had been companies like this when I worked in electronics, I might have really made it in legitimate companies. <laughs> and, and, you know, you don't realize, you know, all of you that are younger than me, than me how fortunate you are because I, I grew up, you probably know, s slightly autistic. I have this, this Asperger's syndrome and I couldn't really engage other people as a child. I I'm sure, knowing the kind of environment this is, that my stories of saying the wrong things to kids on the playground and being, you know, the only one who couldn't get a girlfriend in school and, you know. And even when I was bigger, even when I was on the road, I am probably the only guy you will ever talk to who will tell you he played every major concert venue in North America with the biggest rock and roll tours on the planet and never went home with any groupies. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't for lack of interest, it was for total inability. <laughs> so. And, and I know that so many people, you know, in, in technology are, are familiar with how it feels to, to grow up as a misfit. <coughs> you know, when I struggled with other kids as a small child, my parents knew that there was something wrong and there was something different, but nobody knew what it was because they didn't really have a diagnosis of Asperger's in use in those years. And back in the 1960s, autism was really only diagnosed if you were totally disabled and it was like, you know, it was like a really bad thing because you were sent to a state school and I was threatened with that kind of thing from time to time. It was a place you never wanted to get sent. Luckily, they don't have those things, most of you growing up, much anymore. When I got bigger, I had this sort of, uh, instinctive resistance to authority that I can see in the clothing of all of you. <laughs> Except that, instead of embracing you, like Google does, they try to kind of crack the whip over me and threaten me with the, the truant officer and straight Fs and all the other things they could threaten me with. And finally, I gave up and I dropped out of school and I decided to join a band. Luckily, I had acquired an interest in electronics and because I grew up in a college town and my parents both professors at the University of Massachusetts, I was able to go and hang out in the engineering labs where the older geeks in the labs adopted me as a pet. And that was a really, really good break for me because even though they couldn't teach me anything in Amherst High School and I got straight F's. I wanted to learn, you know, I wanted to know about electronics and science. And let loose in the labs, I actually acquired a graduate level education in the kinds of electronics that interested me, probably by the time I was 15 or 16 years old. And at that time, things went like totally down the drain with my parents, you know, my mother kind of sank into mental illness and my father's a violent alcoholic even though he was a 
department had at the university. It was kind of a different story at home. So I left home and I joined a local band. Now, at the time, that was one of the few places, really, that someone who was a misfit could find a home. You know, everyone in the music business is kind of like a misfit like that. And the great thing about music is they didn't judge you by your credentials. You know, at employers, if you didn't have a degree from the right school, you couldn't even get in the door. But in music, all that mattered was the music that you could create. And for me, it was the devices I could create. I had an ability to see the flow of the signals inside these devices I made, which at first were amplifiers, and then they became filters and signal processors, and they became progressively more exotic things. And I worked for bigger and bigger bands until I found myself working for Pink Floyd Sound Company. And I made many pieces of sound equipment that surely most all of you who've listened to music from the 70s, you know, you've heard my stuff. But the thing about it is you're like totally in the background. And I know that you guys working on things like putting in buildings in Google Earth, you know, you like to think, well, that's my building, and all the millions of people that use it, they never have any idea who you are. And it was sort of like that with me. Everybody knew who the musicians were, and they knew the names of the band, and they knew what kind of guitars they played, and they knew where the records were recorded. Nobody knew who made the amplifiers. Nobody had any idea. But then one day, we were building a monitor system for KISS, and they came into the studio, and I got talking to Ace Freely when he was like digging at the front of a Les Paul guitar with a chisel. And even for a, a freak world like that, that was like beyond the pale. And I, I went over to him to see what he was doing. And he said he wanted to make this guitar smoke. So I said, well, we could do that. We could hollow it out. We could put a box in there. We can line it. We can put smoke bombs in it. And he turns to his roadie and he says, Tex, have Gibson send this guy some guitars. And, and I, when I was off. And, uh, and you know, that was the first time in my life that I achieved personal recognition for something I had done. Because I had seen my sound equipment play all these huge arenas and stuff, but nobody ever knew it was me, nobody knew who I was. When Ace took that smoking guitar out, and some of you that are KISS fans, you'll remember we played it on 2000 Man in the early tours. We'd come out, and, and he'd play it, and he'd flick the switch, and the pickup would snap open, and smoke would start pouring out, the audience would just roar. And it was the proudest moment of my life, because I realized, you know, they were roaring for this thing I had created. But it was kind of a hard life, you know, you were working 18 hours a day, and there's all this, you know, there's all this coke and stuff, and there's all, you know, <laughs> and, and the thing is, at the time, Everybody thought, oh, it's just cool, you know, I could do all that stuff you wanted. Of course, now, you know, I've gone to some get-togethers of the band 15 years later, and I've seen these people's lives are just totally destroyed, and they're, they're dead, or they're, you know, they're sick with AIDS, and they're just totally in the gutter, or they're in prison. But that was all in the future. We didn't, we didn't know that. The thing is, what I did know is I would do that stuff, and I felt like I was smarter and cleverer and cuter and all, but it never really made any difference. Girls didn't ever seem to think I was cuter, even if I thought I was cuter. And I didn't seem to do anything any better than, you know, than when I wasn't doing it. And I sort of started looking at people that were doing that stuff, and I realized, you know, they were drunk or stone fools when you looked at them from the outside. And I had such trouble getting along with people anyway that it kind of put me off doing it. So I wasn't really into the drugs. And and frankly, it was kind of lonely, you know? I was, I was out on the road, and I had, by that time, I had a girlfriend back at home. And I knew some of the people on the crew, but we'd play these halls, and there'd be, you know, 50,000 people. It's just this, like, amorphous mass out there, you know? And I had no idea how to connect to those people. I couldn't, I could never do it. So I decided to seek a regular job, and. At the time, the closest thing they had to a Google environment was toy companies. So I went to work at Milton Bradley designing electronic games. They wanted to design toys with speech sense, speech sense 
and uh, sound effects. Of course, I was ideally qualified to do that kind of stuff, and I did okay doing creative work. But, you know, the pool of creative talent in companies like that was small. And if you did well at it, you got promoted, and you moved one level above being the engineer walking in off the street, and you were in management. And it wasn't the kind of management that you guys deal with here. It was like management with a baseball bat behind the desk, you know, and these guys, you know, they learned to be tough running a factory, and now they got some software engineers that are going to kick them into line too, you know. And <laughs> I, uh, I didn't quite... I didn't quite have the people skills to do that. I couldn't, I couldn't make the transition from being creative to doing performance reviews and motivating employees and doing marketing presentations. And even though I went through a couple of different jobs in a few different companies and I kind of rose through the ranks, I could see that I was destined for failure at that. Now I had always had this interest in automobiles. so. I decided that I was going to quit my last job in electronics and I was going to start a business fixing Mercedes and Rolls Royce and Land Rover and Jaguar cars in my driveway. And I didn't have much of a place to do it, you know, I had, uh, I had a garage that was about the size of four of these conference tables here. I had a little tiny house that was worth less than the cars customers were bringing me. And I did it in this old industrial city, Springfield, Massachusetts, with no native population of those kinds of cars. But it was kind of a field of dream story. You know, I advertised, and people would bring me these cars out, and I guess through force of will, people could see that even if I was a weirdo, I was a weirdo that loved machinery. And, and it turned out to be a great choice for a geek like me, because I may not have had bedside manner, and I might not have been polite and smiley and friendly and all of that, but I could make the cars do things nobody else could. And the business got bigger and bigger and bigger, and today people ship us cars from all over the country. We have Land Rovers in our service department from out here, from Moab. You know, we get cars from, from all over. It's the most amazing thing. And I kind of did all that knowing that I was a, a misfit. The thing is, though, knowing it's a misfit is not really the, quite the right word for it, because I imagine a lot of you think of yourselves as misfits. But you are like proud members of a hugely successful company, and you can be proud to be misfits. When I was a misfit, at 16, the stuff I heard was really corrosive and ugly. You know, people said, oh, you're going to end up in jail, you're going to be nothing, you're going to be pumping gas. and the way people saw folks like me back then was very different than the way people see many of you in the environments that you're in today. It's so fortunate, you know, that the world has changed in that regard. I always had this kind of feeling of inferiority and this feeling that I was a fake. I always felt I couldn't go take another real job because people would find out I'm just a high school dropout and just enough to get fired. Somebody could offer me a quarter of a million dollars a year to come work at a company like this, and I'd have been scared to take the job because I'd have figured what would happen. I'd move 2,500 miles away, I'd be in Colorado, and they'd fire me a week later, and I'd just be broke and destitute 2,000 miles from home, and I was never brave enough to take a chance. So anyway, I operated this car business, and I made it successful, and it got bigger and bigger. One day, I became friends with this, this therapist for the Land Rover. And we started going out to lunch. He'd come down, and he'd visit me. One day, he came in with this little purple book called Asperger's Syndrome, and he holds it up to me, and he says, you know, therapists learn not to diagnose their friends, or pretty soon they won't have any friends, but... <laughs> I've got this book that describes you to a T. And I look at it and I say, what's this? And he says, it's a form of autism. And I said, what are you, nuts? And, and he says, no, really. He says, uh, it's not what you think. You know, you look at the book and see. And I opened up the book. And you know, it was like, it was just like seeing a roadmap of your life. It's like on one side, 
you can list all these things that people with Asperger's don't do that the rest of society expects. We don't look at people. We don't have manners. We don't say the expected things. And then there's all these things that we do do that society doesn't expect, that we have these bizarre interests and, you know, rocks and astronomy and, in, and insects and trains and stuff like that. And, and it was like, that was me, you know, he was right. I, I was all of these things. And I was kind of shaken and stunned, but I took the book home and I read it. And I resolved that I was going to change my life. I resolved that I was going to take this knowledge and I was going to teach myself to do the things to make me look normal. And it took me a number of years, <coughs> you know, I did it. I mean, I'm, I'm here now, you know, passing for normal. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you know, it was the most amazing thing. I went from having almost no friends to having friends. People began inviting me to lunch and inviting me to dinner and, and going and doing things with me. I got a call from my bank, and I thought they were telling me they were going to like foreclose on me or something, and they wanted me to join the board. It was just, you know, like it was like the pinnacle of legitimacy. <laughs> and that is what the knowledge of Asperger's brought to me. I decided, after my brother took the writing, he wrote about us all in this Running with Scissors book that I'm sure many of you have read. And I decided to write a story of life with Asperger's after my father died. And I wrote a sort of a short story about that. <clears throat> I talked to my brother about how to do that because I was still plagued with these feelings of being a fraud. You know, I thought, well, I want to tell people what it's like to grow up with this Asperger's. And in particular, I want to show young people that even if you feel defective as a kid, and if you feel really handicapped as a kid, you can grow up and still be a pretty successful adult. But I wasn't sure how to do that because I'm not a psychologist or any kind of medical doctor or really anything at all. And my brother said, well, it's easy. Just tell your stupid stories the way you used to tell them to me when you'd come home from being on the road with rock and roll bands and everyone will see what's wrong with you. <laughs> you know, at first, I thought he was just being a wise guy, but I realized that that's about the truth of it. You know, when I wrote Look Me in the Eye, people read these stories that I tell you in perfect seriousness, like, you know, I opened up the door in my motel room in Florida and there was a water moccasin on the steps. So I went back in the room and I got my gun and I opened the door again and I shot it six times. And, you know, it happened to me was a practical solution to a state problem. It was very clear that if I was going to exit that room that morning, the snake had to be out of the way. And it was also clear to me that the snake was not only a hazard to me, but a hazard to anyone else walking along the patio. So I shot it. Well, the hotel management didn't see things quite the same as I did. But you know, the police saw it the same way as me. The sheriff came over. And the sheriff looked at me, and he looked at the gun, and he looked at the pieces of snake in the grass. And, and he said, by God there, son, if I couldn't kill it with that thing, I'd just drop that gun on the back of the ground, and I'd back away slow and wish that snake good day. And he turned to the hotel manager, and he said, well, Fred, you're lucky this here boy was prepared. Otherwise, you'd have had a real mess if that snake would have bit some kid. And he left. But they still threw me out of the hotel. So... So anyway, these kinds of stories, they, I guess, have illustrated Aspergian thinking. And when the book went on sale, I thought that all of the people who would identify with the book would be real sort of serious freaks like me. And I felt that many of my readership, like me, might best be left in cages, you know. But um, when people began to come to these book appearances, I began getting like totally normal looking, upscale, respectable people telling me that they recognized my stories and they said, you know, I was like that when I was young and 
and boy, I can, you know, I can really relate to your story of how you felt on the playground or in this place or that place. And I like looked at these people and I think, really? Someone like you? And and I look at these guys and you know, and these are guys that like went to, you know, went to Yale and Harvard and were captains of the football team, you know, and I'd I'd see these girls that surely they must have been, you know, they must have been something prestigious in school and not like me and yet they identified with the stories and it was the most amazing thing I realized that by telling these stories I really have sort of illustrated the whole human condition and I found that people began using my book to teach not only what it's like to be autistic but also just tolerance and diversity and understanding to kids as early as fourth grade. When I saw that happening, I started feeling a little bad because I wrote the book with the kind of language we used, you know, when I was growing up. And I was, I was out, you know, with outlaw bikers, <coughs> and old musicians and stuff, and they weren't like the most civil and polite bunch. And the language reflected that. Now, my book didn't have like graphic sex or gratuitous violence because I wasn't really a graphic sex or gratuitous violence kind of guy. But, um, but it did have those words. So I resolved for the paperback edition that I was going to make some changes in the book and I actually rewrote all the dialogue passages to take out the profanity so that if you had a 12 year old kid you could show him this book and you could have him read these passages and not worry about the, the language. I, I had a 12 year old kid at one time, myself, but he grew bigger and now he's not 12 anymore. But if he still were 12, I would not have wanted him reading that stuff. So, I also wrote a new chapter about things I've learned in the year and a half since the book was written. And I wrote a new reading and resources guide. We have a study guide at the back for, for teaching about it. And uh, it's now sort of spreading around the world with this message of, of what it's like to be autistic and the thing that's really great about coming here is that just as I was shocked to hear that I had this thing called Asperger's and Asperger's was a kind of autism, I now know that Asperger's in me is just one point on a continuum and it blends seamlessly from being totally disabled to seemingly normal. And I know that all of you involved in technology, if you're not Aspergian, you're like one step away. You're what I call proto-Aspergians. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that, uh, that many of you proto-Aspergians can see those, uh, those stories. And, and that is why it's such a great honor to come to a place like this, and, and also I am particularly thrilled just because this truly is, like I said at the beginning, this is the kind of place where I really could have made it, you know, when I was younger. If I could have come to a company like this, I wouldn't have had to go out and be on the street, and I could have worked in a place like this, and if I did well, I could have been promoted, and I could have still done creative stuff, because I know that you guys have people my age that do creative stuff. And that just didn't exist when I started out. It is such a great thing. So with that, I guess I should ask you who has questions. Who's to be the first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you a question. OK. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I very much appreciated uh, hearing your story and look forward to um, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at the book yet, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, as you described uh, you know, some of what you experienced growing up and, and uh, the kind of circuitous path and all this stuff, um, you know, it, this may or may not be difficult to do, but I, I would imagine that each of us has challenges uh, that, that we face in life. I certainly have had many. And so I was wondering if you would summarize into, um, in, in the context of, you know, some people just don't want to engage the difficult things and just avoid. But people who become empowered, perhaps as you have, 
generally find a time in their life when they engage those things that, that are hard to deal with. So if there was a basic message or something around what motivated you to kind of dig into things that have brought very positive change in your life, and how would you summarize that? What, what would be the, the basis? First of all, I think all humans want to be loved and want to be part of the pack. Some of us, like me, don't have very functional emotional intelligence when we are young. So the problems for me started with that. I could not tell what nonverbal messages you were sending to me if you were a grown up talking to me. You, like for example, I could drop this glass on the floor and break it, and you'd say, that's great, look what you've done. And I would listen to you, and I would not understand that you were sarcastic, and I would not understand that you were mad. I would understand that you said, that's great, look what you've done. And, and it would puzzle me, because I wouldn't have thought breaking a glass would be great, but maybe it would, <laughs> what do I know? And I would say, okay, I could break another one. And you'd get furious, and you'd yell at me. If you were a kid, and you came up to me, and you said, look at my new picture book, I might say, I like astronomy. And that was not the response you wanted. And you would try again, and you'd say, look, it's all about horses. And I would repeat, I like astronomy and you would wander off. And as funny as those things are today, every one of those failed encounters for me carried with it a sense of real crushing sadness. <clears throat> because each time I wanted to say the right thing, I wanted you to like me for whatever I had done, and I wanted you to share your picture book with me. But I didn't know how to respond to you in a way that would work. And that's because my Emotional intelligence didn't really function. I could respond to your spoken words, but that was it. So I knew that I had a problem. I didn't know what the problem was. I didn't know there was this nonverbal communication. It is just as if there is a whole other spectrum of colors in the world, and I see them, and none of you guys do. How would you ever know that I am working from a different deck of cards than you? You wouldn't. So. When I learned about autism and Asperger's, it, it really opened my eyes to what I had been missing all my life. And I still wanted to be, you know, popular. I mean, you know, all of, all of us who were kind of geeks, we were, we were more or less functional when we were in school. I was maybe less functional than you because probably the majority of you actually graduated from high school and attended a college. But still, I imagine you, too, had feelings of not fitting in. And, you know, you might have looked at, you know, those, uh, you know, those guys that were the football quarterbacks and the girls that were the cheerleaders, and everyone loved them, and they were popular, and they had friends. And, and at some level, you'd say, ah, oh, they're just, you know, just this or that. But at another level, you kind of wish, I, I wish I could have had friends like that. And at 40 years old, I still wanted friends. And that's what drove me to try and change myself when I learned about Asperger's. And I think that's a basic human desire. I think we all want that. Yes? So do you feel like you've developed emotional <coughs> intelligence? And how did you go about doing that? I would say that I developed, I developed what's called, what I would call like a logical intelligence. Um, in my book, I talk about this. There are a few chapters on that. Like, I couldn't sense what your body language was saying to me instinctively. And if you wonder about, like, who can sense things instinctively, you look at a mother with some small children. Mothers are kind of the peak in humanity of emotional intelligence or <coughs> nonverbal communication. I was never like that. But you know what I did? was I took my logical mind, which was really strong, 
And I said, okay, there's this universe that I didn't know was there, but I'm going to try and figure it out. And maybe I can't instinctively tell what your body language is saying, but I can memorize, you know, what people that look like you think. And I'd say, well, I'd give 75, 80% chance this guy's mad. And I'd, I'd give it 75% odds that she likes me. And that's a hell of a lot better than just guessing. And, you know, and that, um, that's as good an emotional intelligence, you know, really as it takes to get very far in life for someone who doesn't have it. And, and that's something that I guess I, I would submit to you that any reasonably smart person can do to make their life better. I talk uh, at some length about that in the last half of my book. And, um, and I think the other thing that, that I see is, uh, you know, I've kind of learned what society expects of people in general. So I've learned like what things might be weird, what things might not be weird, and even if the things are weird, some things are okay and some things aren't okay. So I've, I've learned that. And I, I guess uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say I taught myself emotional intelligence, but I, I taught myself something that works in its place. And, and before somebody even asks, sometimes people will say, so that's like a fake emotional intelligence. And, and I'd like to assure you that it is not a fake at all. It may be that I can't instinctively see things that that mother can see, but the mother and I have exactly the same goal. We both want to read the nonverbal communications of the other person in order to have a mutually beneficial and successful exchange. So however we achieve the result, it's real. Just because I can't do it instinctively does not make it a fake. So, yes? And related to that, um, do you think it could be that, that what you have is, is actually identical to true emotional intelligence? It's just that you learned it at a different time, and so it seems like a different thing. But could it be that, you know, as children, we're going through the same kind of logical analysis and coming up with these rules that tell us what people are thinking? That is a wonderful engineer's suggestion. <laughs> it is exactly what I would have suggested myself two years ago. I've been really fortunate since writing this book to have some really remarkable people read it and contact me. Um, last week, I was contacted by some of the neuroscientists at Harvard Medical School and they asked me if I would participate in a study with them that actually reached into the workings of emotional intelligence and they wanted to use high-powered electromagnetic energy to induce tiny electrical currents in the brain and change the balance of how we think in certain areas. After working with these folks, I can tell you from personal knowledge that no, they are not the same. They're different, but they're related. When you as a kid, if you're slightly autistic like me, and your emotional <coughs> intelligence doesn't work real well, but you're pretty smart. You know you have a problem. You know that those people are angry, and you know that those kids don't want to be your friend, and you want that. And you see other kids with friends, so you know it's not natural. You know you have a problem, but you don't know exactly what it is. So what do you do? You think about that all day long. What did I do wrong? And what could I do differently? And what happened? And you watch the other kids. What do they do to each, with each other that I don't do? So in a sense, you become like a little musical prodigy that plays scales on the piano every day for three hours a day, except you're not playing scales on the piano, you are watching other people figuring out what went wrong for you. And I believe that it was that thought process that developed the unusually powerful logical brain that took me so far in the world of music and electronics. So the lack of that working emotional intelligence gave me the logical intelligence that ultimately helped me solve my problems in life, but they are two totally different things. I now see that. So, yes? A couple of us have had 
discussed before about, you know, when you talk about the high school quarterback, well, if that person had tremendous talent in one area, people wouldn't be pushing that person towards developing other sides of their personality. They would, they would work with that person to become, you know, a great quarterback. Where so many times with Asperger's people or, or autistic kids, we see so much emphasis on where they're lacking rather than emphasis on what do they bring to the table, what are their, what are their skills in discovering that. And I, I was just wondering your comments on that or that, your thoughts. That is a really important point. I'm glad that you have brought that up. <clears throat> when you work with kids with Asperger's and autism, you really see just the disability components of the condition. When you're dealing with a kid in a school system, or when you were in school systems, <clears throat> the focus is on the stuff you can't do. You know, you don't have friends, or you say the wrong things, or you don't do this, or you don't do that. It is all just a litany of failure. And when you're a kid in that environment, what can you really say except life totally sucks, everything's bad. Um, one thing that you illustrate here, you know, you're interested in computers and software, and you're not here because they weren't hiring at CVS. You're here because you had special interests. You know, these kids with Asperger's that have these various disability components also have special interests. And those interests may be railway locomotives, or it may be software programming, or it may, may be any number of things. When they're 12 and 13 years old, the other kids laugh at them for that. It is really actually a serious problem in our country. Those of you with kids yourself, you may know that if you've got a kid now that loves math, we ridicule our children in America for loving math. But you know it is those talents that will take you to the top of the world. You know, those, when you're a boy and you're 12 years old and the girls in class make fun of you because you love math and nobody wants to be your friend. It's those same girls that think, oh, I'd love to marry a guy like that that's brilliant at math and owns a software company. You know, the tables are totally turned when you're 30 years old. So one thing that's real important is for all of us, but especially the Aspergians and Proto-Aspergians among us, to act as role models for these young kids that are struggling because to a large extent as we teach ourselves how to behave the disability aspects of our condition fade away and you don't really see me today as disabled and yet if you saw me when I was 12 you most assuredly would have so you can see how it, it transforms as you get old and that's a real important thing for young people to see because they are in the part of it that's like almost all bad so, yes? Along those lines, um, I, was, I was just wondering if you could comment on going through, obviously the work environment has changed quite a bit um, with a company like Google and what's going on. So it's very different than when you were going through it, but as a business owner yourself, um, how do you apply that to your own hiring practices? I mean, is it when, when you're going through and interviewing somebody who's gonna work for you, um, do you recognize these skills and are you able to you know, translate that into this person will be very successful even if they're not going to be management, you know, um, a manager at my company? I wish I could tell you that I had a large enough company that I could employ those kinds of ideas. <laughs> okay. But in a small automobile business with only 10 people, um, you kind of take people in um, after kind of getting to know them. The people in our company have mostly been there a long time and we, we meet them through personal referrals. Um, we meet somebody and we think, well, he might, you know, he might fit in and we don't really have an opening now. And, but at some point we might take that person into the company. Um, I'm afraid my company's too small to really employ that to any significant extent because we don't have management and stuff like that. But I wish we did. <laughs> so, anyway, do we have more questions or shall I sign books or what shall we do here? Yes, you have one. So as you say in your like emotional analysis of people that you spend more time in like, conscious thought whereas other people might just do it naturally. And do you find that exhausting? Yeah. <laughs> um, it is it can be tiring 
to have to constantly think about something that other people do instinctively. Um, yes, it, it can be tiring. One thing that has really helped with me is the more knowledge I have gained, the less anxious and sad I am. Many people that you see with Aspergianish conditions, when they're younger, they almost have like a hunted animal look. You know, you see like looking around. There's a movie called Billy the Kid about a fellow with Asperger's who's 15 years old at a high school in Maine. You watch scenes of him in the cafeteria and you'll see what I mean. Um, when I was young, I was always on guard because I never really knew what was going on and at any moment somebody could like attack me. I mean, they wouldn't like physically attack me, but, but they could make fun of me or they could, I could, they could say something, they could pounce on me for something I didn't do. So my whole life went on in a state of wariness. And not only that, so many of these things did happen to justify the wariness that I also lived in a state of sadness because I wanted success in my engagements with other people, but I had so many failures, and the failures make you sad. And when that goes on long enough, it can lead to withdrawal, <clears throat> sadness can turn into depression, and you know, you can end up with permanent serious psychological problems. Luckily, I went the other way by gaining knowledge. The more knowledge you have, of what other people are thinking and feeling towards you and what they're doing between themselves, the less reason you have to be anxious so you don't burn your energy up being wary. You don't lose energy being sad when you change your life so that your encounters with people are successes and not failures. So it's, it's again something that I believe we can make better within ourselves. The, the great wonder of this is that so much of what I'm talking about here is, is stuff that you can change inside you. It doesn't need medication or treatment. It just comes from within. So, yes? Um, I wondered if you could speak to the, very, the varying approaches uh, at one extreme, autism being considered a, a disease versus maybe at the other extreme, it's uh, indicative of neurological evolution? Well, you, you asked about autism as a disease at one extreme and evolution at the other. I don't think you would find any reputable scientist who would characterize autism as a disease. I think there is general agreement <coughs> that autism is a neurological difference. Um, now, recognizing that it's a neurological difference, it is a difference that bestows a mixture of gift and disability components on everyone. People start out with some balance. Some kids start out more disabled. Some kids start out more gifted. I believe that my own life shows powerful evidence that you can shift that balance in your favor in the gifted direction. I think that that's abundantly clear when you look at the historical record of me. And I think that Temple Grandin's another wonderful example of that. Look at video of Temple 20 years ago and look at her today. So obviously, we can make ourselves better. Um, I think that there is a group of people who say, okay, whether it's a difference or a disease or whatever, I want to cure my child. While, on the one hand, I sympathize with the desire of any mother to make her child's life better, and if you're a mother who has a kid who is significantly disabled by autism, of course you want to make your kid's life better. Um, there's another side to that, though, and that is that I have talked to many, many people on the spectrum in these speaking engagements and talks and stuff that I've done. And I have yet to meet a person with any degree of autism who says to me, I wish they could cure me. 
you know, people say to me, I've learned to accept how I am. They say I'm happy at how I am. People like me will say, I can show you how autism has given me significant competitive advantages in life. I don't really meet people who say I'm sick and I want a cure. Now that doesn't mean that we love the disability components of autism. Because people do say to me, you know, if, if you could show me how to figure out that emotional intelligence, I would love to do it. But see, that is somebody who says, okay, here is a particular component of autism that makes life hard for me. I would like to overcome it. That's fundamentally different from saying the whole thing's a disease and I want to get rid of it. And, and I think that if you approach it like that, you'll find that you're more likely to achieve success. You know, you pick the components that you struggle with and you work to fix them, and at the same time, you find what your kid is good at. And, and I would suggest to you, if you're a mother, that that's one of your biggest challenges, because if you look at the tremendously successful people in the United States with Asperger's and what those people do. And then you look at your kid, your kid is say six or seven or eight years old. How on earth will you know that your kid had these scientific talents that manifest themselves in these 40 year old Aspergians that win Nobel Prizes or whatever? It's very, very difficult for you to know what your kid's gifts are. And as much as you think, well, I know my child or whatever, it can be a lot of work, and I think that's a very productive place for mothers to devote their energy, to find the gifts in these children. So that's, I would suggest. Do we have, uh, yes, well, the questions keep coming, yes. <laughs> what advice would you uh, provide now in, in the benefit of hindsight to a 10-year-old with Asperger's? The first thing I would say to a 10-year-old with Asperger's is that life gets steadily better once you go into college and everything is going to turn around. <clears throat> All those people that make fun of you at 10 are going to look up to you and admire you and want to be your friends when you're 30. All those things that people say are stupid when you are 10, they're going to say, I wish I knew that because all of a sudden the kid with the stupid interest in trains has become the Union Pacific Railways, you know, superintendent of engineering. You know, and, and all of a sudden, all of that's going to turn around. So I would, I would, I guess I would do more than say it. I would try and show that 10-year-old examples of people who have Aspergian differences like him that have achieved things like that and say, look, this guy, everybody said this was stupid, and now look at what he does today. And, and I would try also and expose that 10-year-old to smart older people. I briefly touched upon that in my talk, how they adopted me as a pet in the engineering labs. And I, I told you how I consistently failed to engage other children my own age. One reason for that is that kids don't really have the mental agility to keep up with the weird stuff that a kid with Asperger's might say or do, because they don't say or do the expected things. But grown-ups can keep up. So if you can put older people in your child's life who are mentally agile, and they can show a book and say, here, look at this book on, you know, on horses. When he says, I like elephants, the grown-up can say, really? Do you know about African and Indian elephants? And he can lead him down a path that's successful instead of a failure. So that's a really big thing. And, and in that same vein, I would suggest to you that your kid may gravitate towards older people for that reason. When I was 15, when I was 20, all my friends were five or six or seven years older than me for that reason. And the older I got, the less I tended to have older friends because we kind of you know, even out once we get to be 30, 40, 50 years old. But that was a big thing at a young age. So those would be my two first suggestions. Yes? Um, when you were uh, like younger, like 10, 20, that age, did you ever find that, so you had like a disconnect with what people consider normal kids. Did you ever find that you would meet somebody else that had Asperger's that maybe you guys could communicate on a more, like a more normal level for you and them? 
Well, that's like almost an Aspergian mating question. <laughs> First, um, remember that when I was 10 years old, I didn't know what Asperger's was. I only knew I had a problem and didn't have friends. So it wasn't really possible for me to say, he's like me, because I didn't know what the definition of me was relative to you. Um, if I had had that knowledge, maybe the answer would be yes. When we move forward in time to when I was somewhat older, I didn't know about Asperger's when I was 20, but I knew about geeks. I mean, I saw Star Trek and I, I went to science fiction conventions and stuff like that. And you know, I mean, you just laugh at that, but, but that is a place that you would meet other Aspergian people. Um, I know that for people with Asperger's and even these proto-Aspergians with limited social skill, finding a mate is, is a goal and a challenge. And you tend to think, well, if I could find a girl with Asperger's, she would understand me. And I'm not so sure of that from my own <laughs> experience with mate acquisition and retention. <laughs> I think that uh, when you are drawn to another person with Asperger's as a potential mate, it's like both of you are emotionally blind. And to me, that is a potential formula for disaster. My current experience with mate retention suggests that a girl with a lot of emotional intelligence, the exact opposite of an Aspergian like me, is a more stable and solid proposition for a mate because then you have skills that complement one another. She can see the things that I can't see and I can solve the logical, practical problems that she can. And it works together and it, it's functional. And I wrote about that in a chapter in my book called Married Life. So that is my, my thought on that. I mean, I'm sure that any possible combination of mate could work. But being a logical guy, and I think if you think about it logically, that to me sounds like potentially the best fit. Um, I'll offer you a thought about finding girls with emotional intelligence. Now those of you who are girls in the audience, you might wonder, well, why doesn't he say something about finding guys with emotional intelligence? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but I do have something about, about girls. Um, there is a change in the female brain that occurs when children are born. There's a slight change in the male brain that occurs when they become fathers. There's a much bigger change in the female brain. And I think it's, it's evident if you look at people who do not have kids who are, say, 25 years old. If you look at females without kids at 25, you look at females with young children who are 25. And you're observant. You will see that the 25-year-olds with children display significantly greater emotional intelligence and they can have, they can deploy that emotional intelligence not just in their dealings with their own children, but in their dealings with everyone. Um, there presumably are some, some girls who become mothers who have more and some who have less. And you might wonder, how do you predict which 20-year-old will have a lot and which will have a little, because I want one with a lot. <laughs> and uh, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but I believe an answer exists, and it's possible someone could find it. And when you ask the opposite question, <coughs> girls looking for guys, I, I don't really know what to say. People, you know, people will say to me, well, I've got this husband or this boyfriend with Asperger's, and he doesn't, he doesn't give me the emotional responses I want. Um, the one thing I can say when a female says to me, this guy doesn't give me these responses and he's got Asperger's, is 
if you read my stories of being young and you read about my feelings, it's going to be absolutely crystal clear in those stories that I have the same feelings that any other kid did. The things that made you sad make me sad. The things that make me happy make you happy. I can feel a great fondness or love for you. You may not see it, but that does not mean I don't feel it. So the challenge in understanding a guy with Asperger's is not to make him feel the things, it's to develop an ability to see it in him if he can't show it. It's, that's a hard question, and I, I wish I could answer it better because I know it's real important to people, but, but the business of females seeing males and males seeing females, those issues, I believe, have fundamentally different answers, as I just tried to illustrate in my <laughs> humbling way. So, well, shall we sign books here? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you all. For